My name is Dr. Jane, J-A-N-E, middle initial C, Burns, B-U-R-N-S. I'm a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego. I am director of the Kawasaki Disease Research Center at UCSD and Rady Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for being a part of this interview. So, you know, it, it's you heard this virus described as a moving target, and there seems to be a new twist and turn as we go along with every day. Can you tell me more about this new uh, resurgence or flare up? How would you describe it of Kawasaki illness? We're definitely seeing something new in communities that have been heavily impacted by COVID-19 in adults. And this is taking two forms. The first form seems to be a remarkable increase in children coming in with typical Kawasaki disease. So it's important to understand what Kawasaki disease is, and it basically is fever and a number of signs that parents can see, such as bloodshot eyes, red lips and tongue, a rash on the body, red hands and feet, and a persistent fever. So that is a disease that we recognize in children. We take care of it at Rady Children's Hospital. It does require hospitalization. It's the most common cause of acquired heart disease in children. It needs treatment with a high dose of intravenous immunoglobulin, but it's very treatable if caught early. It can cause irreversible damage to the heart in a small subset of patients. The new thing that we're seeing is a new wrinkle, which we're still trying to understand, but does seem to be related to this increase in typical KD, Kawasaki disease. And these are children who are coming in with fever and perhaps some of the signs of Kawasaki disease, but most importantly, heart failure and low blood pressure requiring intensive care, treatment and support immediately. These are very, very ill patients this is something that we have never seen before. And we have to believe at this point in time that it is related to a previous exposure to the virus. This is not like the adult disease where it affects the lungs. This is affecting the heart in many ways similar to the way that severe Kawasaki disease can affect the heart. So in, in some ways, you know, I'm trying to understand whether or not these children are coming down with coronavirus or the exposure to coronavirus is leading to Kawasaki disease. So we think it's the latter, that these children were previously exposed. The best information that we have is coming from the London teaching hospitals. Those in, those data have been gathered together by Professor Michael Levine at Imperial College. And he's gathered together 37 children who have antibody, many of them, to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but they do not have evidence by the PCR test, the, the nasal swab test that we do for the virus. They do not have evidence of active viral infection. So it does seem to be something immunologic. It's something that follows exposure. And if you look at the curves for London, the peak in the adult disease, which was the typical respiratory disease that we all know about, that preceded the appearance of this new syndrome by about three to four weeks. So there's a delay in the peak in a community before we begin to see these children. And Detroit, Washington, D.C., Boston, New Jersey are all being affected by this now, which is a little bit past the peak of their adult COVID disease. Now, based on what you're seeing, um, are, you know, we've saw this in London, as you mentioned, and then now on the East Coast. Do you expect to see it here in San Diego, or are we experiencing this now? We may have already had our first case. I should also mention that based on the London data and based on the experience in Detroit, children of African-American descent or Afro-Caribbean descent may be at increased risk 
of this complication, which would suggest that there's a genetic component. Interestingly, we work very closely with groups in Japan, and they did an impromptu rapid survey across all of Japan, the academic centers, and no one has seen this in Japan despite the fact that they have COVID in their community. We also have contacts in Taiwan and Korea. Similarly, no one has seen this in those countries. That's important. You mentioned that we may have seen our first case. Is there somebody that matches the profile of uh, showing Kawasaki illness and having been previously exposed here in San Diego? The piece that we don't have yet because we have to get uh, review, a review from our ethics committee in order to be able to do antibody testing on the parents for research purposes. The, that's the piece that we're missing. What we do know is the child presented in shock with typical signs of Kawasaki disease. And so certainly in this period, that would lead us to suspect that this might be a similar case. And is that patient being treated here at Rady Children's? The patient was treated at Rady Children's Hospital, did very well, and uh, is home. Excellent. And, and what, you know, it, 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 obviously this is going to be a concern for local parents, all parents. Uh, what sort of or advice would you give uh, when, you know, seeing some of these signs? And what signs should they look for? So I urge all parents to educate themselves about the signs of Kawasaki disease. And a great resource is the kdfoundation.org. It's a parent-based organization. At their website, they have photographs of what Kawasaki disease looks like. And it's fever and everything turns red. Red eyes, red lips, red rash, red hands and feet. That requires treatment. Those patients need to come in to Rady Children's Hospital and be evaluated. On the other hand, there is this new problem in children that may appear just with fever and extreme illness in the child who will obviously look sick and urgently sick and dialing 911 is the appropriate thing to do. It, it sounds very serious. It, you know, in, in, as you watch this illness spread and new symptoms develop, you know, what is, what is your observation just on coronavirus uh, in itself? Well, clearly this disease is teaching us a lot of new things in medicine. This may actually be a very, very important clue as to fundamentally what Kawasaki disease is. And again, the relationship between the shock syndrome and Kawasaki disease is still under investigation, but obviously there's guilt by association and these two things are happening together in a community. It's a little hard to walk away from the idea that they're, they're not related. So I think we, we have to consider, at least for now, that they could be related. Kawasaki disease is a condition or a syndrome for which we don't have a single agent or trigger or etiologic agent so if the SARS-CoV-2 virus can be one of these triggers, that is going to teach us a lot about what Kawasaki disease fundamentally is and hopefully lead us to a better understanding of how it can be so detrimental to the heart. And that's a key note is uh, the end concern is that this can affect the child's heart if let go long enough, I would assume? Yes, and because Kawasaki disease, the typical kind that we see, is so treatable, parents need to come in. Don't stay home because you're worried about being exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the emergency room. It's not there. Do come in, do seek medical care if your child has persistent high fever and some of these other signs. The child needs to be evaluated. Very interesting, and, and you know, again, you know, we learned and, and saw these uh, articles and stories today about Europe and New York, uh, very remarkable that it could be a case here in San Diego. We'll see. Um, there are other ideas around that perhaps we have a different strain of the coronavirus here, that ours is more the Asian strain 
And on the East Coast, based on sequence data, it's the Italian strain. This is an RNA virus and it mutates fairly rapidly. So the question is, is it a virus specific issue that, that can trigger this, this devastating shock syndrome in children? Is it a host genetics issue where certain ethnic groups are more susceptible to having this kind of reaction? Those are all questions that we'll be answering as we go forward. And we're very involved with those investigations here at the KD Research Center at Radio Children's Hospital in UCSD. And, and Dr. Foy, I let you go. If you could just recap the factors that you know you're watching and learning in in this new warning, uh, which I believe pre-exposure, and then uh, uh, could you could you recap that for me? So children who are developing this shock syndrome are coming from families where there have been family members likely infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they're coming from communities that have been particularly hard hit. So Italy, London, New York, et cetera. The children have not necessarily had any signs or symptoms of infection with the virus. And we think that this Kawasaki-like syndrome that is happening is something that is mediated by the immune system, a response by the body to being exposed to the virus previously, but now the immune system gearing up and then suddenly attacking in a way that causes illness in the child. And, and again, African-American children may be at more risk, is that true? So based on the London data and based on the experience in Detroit, this is disproportionately affecting African, African-American, and Afro-Caribbean children. Whether or not that's going to continue to be true, we just need larger numbers. So that could be an artifact of small numbers, but it's clear, at least in London, that based on the population in greater London of those different groups, these children are overrepresented. Got it. Doctor, thank you so much for the interview, and we'll make sure and get the word out. I'm sure there's a big concern for local families. Well, I, I want to emphasize that this is rare and that families should not immediately be concerned. The chance of this happening to your child is low. It is not contagious. At least the Kawasaki syndrome part is not contagious. The virus, obviously, is hugely contagious. So these are two separate issues, and I really would like to reassure families that it is very unlikely that your child will be affected by this condition. Great news. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right.